So picture this. It's 1567 and Italy is experiencing a devastating plague that's already killed tens of thousands of people. And if you think that's bad, just wait. It gets worse. You're an Italian grave digger. One day, you're burying the body of a woman who was about 60 when she died. You don't think much of it. As sad as this is, it's pretty much par for the course at this point. You bury the body of the woman, as well as several others, and go about your day. But it's not long before the bodies start piling up again, and there aren't many places left to bury them. So you have to open up this mass grave again. Once you do, you see the corpses you buried a few days earlier, all wrapped in burial shrouds. But there's something strange about one of them. The area of the shroud that should be at the corpse's mouth is completely decayed. The shroud is also much bigger than the others, as if the corpse just ate a full meal. But that's impossible. Dead people can't eat. Or can they? Gingerly, you reach out to unwrap the burial shroud from the corpse's head. It's the body of the old woman, bloated and flushed, fluid seeping from her mouth. You're horrified, but fortunately, you know just what to do. Taking a brick or rock laying nearby, you open up the woman's mouth and place it in between her jaws. This will prevent the horrible creature she's become from eating, consequently starving to death. Incidents like this have happened in multiple countries all over Europe, as well as the United States. Stories of the dead returning to consume the living stretch all the way back to ancient times. They might sound like they fit our modern definition of zombies, but these creatures have more commonly gone by another familiar moniker, vampires. Let's explore some of these so-called vampire graves and vampire burials. So today, we have a pretty specific view of what a vampire is, give or take a few traits. Vampires drink the blood of their victims. They're hurt or at least weakened by the sun. They're often charming and attractive. And in fact, even though they're technically dead, they don't look like corpses at all. But this isn't how people have always viewed vampires. Generally speaking, a vampire is any dead or undead creature that returns to consume the living. Like I mentioned earlier, that definition has changed over time. A creature like that would probably today be described as a zombie. So before we continue, let's discuss the relationship between these two words. This is the 1954 novel I Am Legend. It follows the last man on Earth surrounded by vampires. Let's check out the official Amazon description. Robert Neville may well be the last living man on Earth, but he is not alone. An incurable plague has mutated every other man, woman, and child into bloodthirsty, nocturnal creatures who are determined to destroy him. By day, he is a hunter, stalking the infected monstrosities through the abandoned ruins of civilization. By night, he barricades himself in his home and prays for dawn. Does that sound familiar? Because it should. About 14 years later, George A. Romero used this story as inspiration for his movie Night of the Living Dead, which gave us our modern idea of the zombie apocalypse. The stories were so similar, when I Am Legend's author Richard Matheson first saw the movie, he thought it was just another adaptation of his book that nobody had told him about. By the way, I Am Legend is really good. If you're looking for something new to read and enjoy post-apocalyptic horror, I recommend it. Link below. But back to vampires. In 2017, the body of an adult male from the 3rd or 4th century AD was found in Northamptonshire in the UK. According to an article on the University of Arizona's official website, the man was found face down with his tongue removed and replaced with a stone. His body had presumably decomposed by the time he was discovered, so I'm not sure how they knew his tongue had been removed but I'm just the messenger. Another discovery from the Czech Republic in 2008 is thought to date back even further, around 4,000 years. This grave held a skeleton with stones placed over its head and chest. Another Czech vampire was found in 1966 in Selakovis, just outside Prague. There were multiple skeletons here, and they all had some sort of 
anti-vampire warding, including face-down burials, otherwise known as prone burials, decapitations, and even nails driven through their temples. In the summer of 2018, the grave of a so-called vampire child was found in the commune of Lugnano in central Italy. The child was thought to be about 10 years old, though their gender couldn't be determined. They had been buried on their side with an egg-sized chunk of limestone inserted into their mouth. At the time of the child's death, there was a malaria outbreak in the region, and the child is thought to have died from malaria. After the discovery, locals began calling the child the Vampire of Lugnano. Also found at the site were animal bones, thought to be used in witchcraft rituals to keep the dead from rising. Other examples of these rituals include one found in Rutland in the UK. This grave was found in a quarry in what used to be a church cemetery. The body dates back to medieval times when Christian burials were done in a very specific way. Bodies had to be in a churchyard, facing east, with their arms crossed over their bodies. Anything deviating from that was worth noting. By the way, these suspected vampire graves and vampire burials are more formally known as deviant burials. There were 73 graves in the cemetery, but one stood out. The body was of a young girl whose head had been removed and placed between her legs. At first, this girl was believed to have been a criminal, but that's actually not likely. For starters, she wouldn't have been buried at the front of the church with her grave easily visible, as was the case. In fact, if she were a criminal, she probably wouldn't have been buried in the church at all. There were also no signs that she had been exhumed and reburied. So someone, probably her parents, had done this to her after she died but before she was buried. Was this young girl believed to be susceptible to returning from the dead? Or is there another reason? Another discovery about 160 miles north in Yorkshire was a bit more gruesome. This find was in the medieval village of Warham Percy. The bodies of 10 people, ranging from toddlers to adults, were mutilated, decapitated, and burned after they died. These rituals were thought to have been carried out to keep their corpses from rising from the dead. But by far, the country with the most vampire burials, or at least the most media surrounding these burials, is Poland. In 2008, archaeologists began excavating a 400-year-old cemetery in the Polish village of Drosko. 333 corpses were found in the cemetery, six of which were thought to be vampire burials. The corpses ranged from teenage to about 60 years old and were buried with sickles across their throats and hips. In 2013, more bodies were found during railway construction in the town of Gliwice in southern Poland. These skeletonized bodies are thought to have dated back to around the 1500s, and just like the Rutland burials, had their heads removed and placed between their legs. Of the 43 bodies found at the site, 17 of them had been buried this way. 2014 brought another discovery. These bodies were found in the Polish town of Kamian Pomorski and thought to date back to the 1600s. They had rocks on their necks, sickles on their throats, missing upper teeth, and stakes driven through their legs. So let's address the question you've probably thought of at least once at this point. Why was this done? Why did these people believe the dead would return to life and eat them. Beliefs differed by culture as to who was susceptible to becoming a vampire after death. In Slavic folklore, babies who were born with teeth or physical deformities could become vampires. Lots of cultures believed people who committed suicide were more prone to vampirism. Some thought the first person to catch a disease during an outbreak was at risk. Others were suspicious of children born out of wedlock or unbaptized babies. Speaking of baptism, or lack thereof, there are also mixed opinions on how the church viewed these vampire burials. Some sources said the church believed vampires were creatures of the devil and therefore embraced these anti-vampire rituals. Other sources thought various churches saw the belief in vampires as antithetical to biblical teachings. But they still thought they might have accepted them to appease pagans of the time, 
possibly hoping to convert them to Christianity later on. According to a 2014 paper on the Drowsko burials, vampire burials were used as a way to enforce social and Christian order, to serve as an explanation for unknown disease and death, and as an economic and monetary commitment to the dead. And of course, some people might not have become suspected vampires until after they died. The woman I talked about in the intro was found on Lazaretto Nuovo Island, just off the coast of Venice, Italy in 2006. She was one of about 50,000 victims of the Venetian Plague of 1576 and was found buried with a brick between her jaws. It was likely put there by a priest or a grave digger who found her body after the mass grave was reopened and mistook her bloating and mouth leakage for vampirism. Since tens of thousands of people died in Venice over the course of a couple of years, I'm guessing these mass graves were reopened pretty often. The grave containing this woman's body may have been reopened just a few days after her death. We now know that bloating and leaks from the nose and mouth occur naturally three to five days after death as a result of decomposition. But 1500s Venetians would have seen this as a sign of vampirism. The decay from the shroud around the corpse's mouth was caused by bacteria from this fluid, which was pushed up through the mouth from the stomach. But at the time, it was seen as a sign that the vampire had eaten away at their shroud. Vampires at the time were thought to seek out the living in an attempt to regain their strength. In many instances, they were blamed for the plagues themselves. The idea being that they used magic to spread the plague so they could increase their ranks. And the Italians weren't the only ones who made this connection between disease and vampirism. The vampire graves at Kami and Pomorsky are thought to be cholera victims. Villagers at the time didn't understand how diseases were spread and thought it was a supernatural phenomenon. So they subjected their dead cholera victims to these rituals, which included taking out their upper teeth and driving stakes through their legs to keep them from returning from the dead. The Polish were known to place sickles over their vampires' throats so that if they tried to get out of their grave, they would be decapitated. The rocks and bricks placed in the mouths were, of course, to keep the vampire from feeding so they would starve to death. But it might not be fair to call these vampire burials at all. A few sources suggested these people might have been buried this way for other reasons. According to a 2015 paper on the Polish burials, a lot of these so-called deviant burials were thought to be of common criminals or other social deviants, not people suspected to be vampires. The skeletons found in Gluis in Poland were found near a set of gallows, further adding evidence to this theory. It's also been speculated that the bodies buried at Drowsko were thought to be subjected to these rituals not because they were thought to be vampires, but simply to ward off evil spirits. It's also been theorized that these people died unexpectedly, such as through violent means. Because of this, they weren't able to receive their last rites, so these rituals were done in an attempt to keep their bodies from being possessed by demons. But if the fear of vampires was a thing in Europe, it managed to find its way to the United States. In 1990, a group of children in Griswold, Connecticut, accidentally discovered what turned out to be a colonial era cemetery. The 29 graves found were all pretty typical of the time, except for one. The skeleton was of a man in his 50s. He had the initials JB spelled out in brass tacks on his coffin, which had been smashed. The skeleton of JB, as the man came to be known, had been beheaded and his thigh bones had been moved up to his rib cage and arranged in a skull and crossbones pattern. Everything unusual about this burial, from the smashed coffin to the rearranged bones, hadn't been done until about five years after JB's death. JB was taken to the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C. to be studied. At first, Scientists were baffled. They had no idea what could have caused someone to rearrange JB's bones like this so long after he had died. Then one person asked the others if they had ever heard of the Jewett City Vampires. 
Jewett City was another nearby town where a few corpses had been unearthed because people thought they were vampires rising from their graves. JB had died of tuberculosis, which at the time was called consumption. Tuberculosis symptoms include paleness, severe weight loss, and the victim generally appearing to be wasting away all possible signs of vampirism. By this time, people did know a little bit more about human decomposition, but they also didn't really study or observe corpses in the weeks following death. So it is possible that someone, for some reason, exhumed JB's body after his death, saw signs of vampirism, and subjected his corpse to these rituals. JB was one of the more well-known vampires of the time, but he's not the only one. The belief in vampires here in the U.S. stretches all the way to the late 1800s with the woman who had come to be known as the last American vampire. Mercy Lena Brown lived in Exeter, Rhode Island. She probably went by her middle name, Lena, since some sources did call her this. I will call her Mercy during this video because that's how I usually see her addressed and just for clarity. Mercy died of tuberculosis on January 19th, 1892, at the age of 19. The disease had already claimed the lives of her mother and sister, and her brother was also sick with it at the time of her death. The rumors on vampirism started after Mercy's death. By this point, her father, George, and her brother, Edwin, were the only family members left, having lost all of the women of the household to tuberculosis. People reportedly spotted Mercy walking through the town, cemetery, and fields, and Edwin even claimed that Mercy had at one point been sitting on his chest, suffocating him. Maybe he meant this in some sort of metaphorical sense, but it wasn't taken that way. Like I mentioned earlier, tuberculosis has symptoms similar to what we think of as vampirism. According to Rhode Island folklorist Michael Bell, the symptoms progressed in such a way that it seemed like something was draining the life and blood out of somebody. Although they were more knowledgeable about disease at the time, people still didn't fully understand tuberculosis. Some doctors even thought it was caused by drunkenness and want among the poor. Because of all these things, speculation began that Mercy was a vampire and the one that had infected not only her brother, but her mother and sister, both named Mary, who had died almost a decade earlier. Finally, about two months after her death, George agreed to have Mercy's body exhumed, along with the bodies of her mother and sister. Both her mother and sister were completely skeletonized, having been dead for years at this point. But Mercy's body was found laying on its side and still fully intact. She hadn't decomposed at all. Her face also appeared flushed. A doctor at the scene said Mercy's body hadn't decomposed because she'd only been buried for a couple of months and because it was cold at the time, it being Rhode Island in March. But to the other townspeople, all these peculiarities were proof Mercy was a vampire. A few townspeople, some of them relatives of Mercy, cut out her heart and lungs and burned them on a pile of rocks. The ashes were mixed with water and given to her brother Edwin to drink as a cure. He still died two months later, so this clearly didn't work. But it did seem to appease the townspeople. Mercy was later reburied in Chestnut Hill Cemetery, where she remains today. George Brown managed to avoid the tuberculosis outbreak that had killed his entire family. He died in 1922. Mercy's legacy still lives on. Visitors to her grave leave memorabilia like fake vampire teeth and cough drops. There are rumors of her ghost haunting a nearby bridge, as well as visiting terminally ill patients and telling them dying isn't so bad. She's thought to have inspired H.P. Lovecraft's short story, The Shunned House, as well as one of the most famous modern vampire stories, Dracula. The legend also played a role in the 2015 horror movie, Almost Mercy. It wasn't really my thing personally, but if you want to check it out for yourself, I'll leave some links below. But vampire belief isn't exactly a thing of the past. Our last story takes place in 2004. 
This case took place in Maritino de Sus, a village in the commune of Salero in southern Romania, a country already linked with modern vampirism. After a string of illnesses, a man named Petra Toma died in December 2003. Just days after his death, his niece said she was having nightmares and feeling ill. She believed her uncle was a stragoi, an undead creature who travels at night to feed on the living. Just for some perspective, you might have also heard this word from the Vampire Academy novels, in which the stragoi were basically the most evil kind of vampire. Six villagers in Maritino de Sus, including the woman's own father, went to Petrotoma's grave, opened his tomb, and removed his body. According to them, his mouth was stained with blood and swollen. They split open his ribcage, impaled his heart, and burned it at the village crossroads. Then, much like in the Mercy Brown case, they mixed the ashes with water and gave it to Petrotoma's niece to drink as a cure. Either Petrotoma's daughter or his wife ended up going to the police with this story. Different sources said different things. There was an investigation and all six men were charged with illegally exhuming Petrotoma's corpse. They were all given six months suspended sentences. This incident made international news, but how do the people of Maritino de Sus view it? A belief in vampires, or at least similar creatures, is nothing new in Romania. This is, of course, the home of Vlad the Impaler, whose connection to vampires doesn't even need to be explained. The belief in vampires is passed down through generations in the country, and incidents like what happened to Petra Toma aren't unheard of. According to one of the villagers, no one is bothered who did it. It's their own business. This ritual often takes place, but in secret, within the family. The problem comes when the police get involved. Most of the villagers didn't seem to take issue with the ritual, though the village's mayor and at least one Romanian Orthodox priest have condemned it. When you look at cases like Petra Toma or even Mercy Brown, it's easy to ridicule the people involved. Both these incidents took place in times when we were supposed to be too advanced, too enlightened to believe in things like vampires. But I don't think we should judge them too harshly. As folklorist Michael Bell put it regarding the American vampire pandemic, I start with the assumption that people of past generations were just as intelligent as we are. I look for the logic. Why would they do this? Once you label something just a superstition, you lock off all inquiry into something that could have been reasonable. Reasonable is not always rational. It's also important to remember that people believe all sorts of strange things today. I won't name anything specific, but I bet you're thinking of something right now that bugs you. In the modern day United States, or whatever country you're from if you're from outside the US, the belief in vampires can seem bizarre. But to people who are genuinely concerned for their loved ones, digging up a corpse and burning its heart might be, in their eyes, the only option. Though, just to be clear, I am not condoning criminal activity. But of course, that is just my opinion, and I would love to hear yours in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it, and for more dark content, I hope you'll consider subscribing and hitting that bell. If you're interested in vampire fiction, you should check out my novella Children of Dust, which, much like Dracula, was inspired by the Mercy Brown case. I won't lie and pretend it's anywhere near as good as Dracula, but I think you'll still enjoy it. The link is the first one in the description. Thank you so much for watching and have a creepy day. Bye guys.